Today we are going to have a guest speaker for the sermon. <laughs> but he wasn't able to make it today, so I'll be reading the sermon for him. <laughs> this is from James Bryan Smith from his book titled The Good and Beautiful Life. Uh, in chapter 5 he discusses the problem of lust. So this is based on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and since Jesus discusses lust in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that's one of the things he talks about. And I printed it out so in larger type so I could read it easier. <laughs> uh, he starts by saying, Contemporary society is obsessed with sexuality and lust. Our magazines are dripping with it. Our television programs are obsessed with it. Much of our music is nothing short of a series of odes to lust, covered in the veneer of love. We are fascinated with sexuality. People live for sex, kill for sex, die because of sex. Over 14,000 sexual references are made on TV every year. The average person will view over 100,000 of those references in his or her lifetime. An actress on a popular crime drama was asked why her character wore such low-cut revealing outfits when forensics experts usually wear smocks. She answered, the more cleavage, the higher the ratings. We have become so desensitized to sexual imagery that advertisers, advertisers know they must use provocative images just to get our attention. Christians, as well as Muslims, Jews, and even non-religious but morally concerned people, have tried to stand against the culture and maintain the position that sexual purity, chastity, and fidelity are important. We can go to church, pray, sing hymns, set our minds on things above, and then go home, watch a football game, and be exposed to dozens of commercials and ads for upcoming shows that are full of sex and violence. So he asks, who will help us find a way to live faithfully in this sexually confused culture? There are two dominant narratives or stories, he says, one from church, one from popular culture. Both are false. Both lead to frustration and failure. Dallas Willard, uh, another theologian, he notes that the two main error, errors in the area of human sexuality are these. First, believing that all sexual desire is evil. And second, believing that all sexual desire is good. The first narrative says that sexual desire is inherently sinful. This story has been dominant in Christian circles from the beginning of church history. There are many early Christian writers to whom we can trace this belief, but perhaps the most famous is the brilliant and influential writer Augustine of Hippo in North Africa. Augustine, writing in the 4th and 5th centuries, was of the opinion that sexual desire was sinful. He even said that sexual intercourse transmits original sin and is essentially sinful. Augustine struggled with lust throughout his life, which is clear when you read his confessions. Uh, he prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> which is a clear indication of inner conflict. He eventually adopted the narrative that sexual desire is bad. Complete celibacy is good. Augustine's writings have dominated the thinking of most Christians, Catholics and Protestants, for the past 1500 years. But he wasn't the only person who adopted this narrative. Throughout the history of the church, before and after Augustine, few Christian thinkers teach a positive position on human sexual desire. The vast majority speak of sexuality as dark, evil, and sinful. Up to the medieval period, some of the most spiritually dedicated men and women lived in monasteries, where they would rarely see someone of the opposite sex, lest they be tempted to sin. Even in our day, many churches have difficulty teaching a balanced view of human sexuality. The church's narrative is not spoken out loud, but comes through relative silence. 
Don't ask. Don't tell. Don't talk about sex. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's not <laughs> Youth pastors occasionally address the subject with fear and trembling <laughs> and with parental tradition and a measure of embarrassment. But it is rarely addressed from the pulpit or in Sunday school. Uh, adult Sunday school, I assume he means. <laughs> uh, the subject is taboo. Yet, he, Smith says, those sitting in the pews are having affairs, struggling with pornography, and wrestling with lust, as Augustine did. By refusing to address sexuality, we sometimes imply that it is sinful. We, our silence causes confusion, it leads to ignorance, and it further separates our souls from our bodies. When we hear about the sexual failings of pastors and priests, we are doubly shocked. How could a holy person do such a thing? Christians, it appears, come up from the waters of baptism having been made eunuchs for the kingdom. <laughs> Uh, our silent narrative, he says, leads to shame and denial about something that ought to be affirmed. Now, the second narrative, he says, comes from contemporary Western culture. All sexual desire is good. Uh, now, this narrative is not a recent product of the 20th or 21st centuries. Uh, the sexual attitudes and behaviors of the Roman Emperor Caligula or some of the Greek philosophers would make us blush. It might be more widespread today, though. The narrative that all sexual desire is good became accepted in American culture in the 1960s as young people espoused free love. Uh, Hugh Hefner created the Playboy philosophy which taught that sex is a purely natural act and everyone ought to have as much as they want. Uh, today, we see it most clearly in television and movies, where the majority of sexual activity occurs outside of marriage. In music videos, barely clothed women dance provocatively, and the lyrics are often lusty compositions about the joys of sex. The implicit narrative is that the good life is the lust-filled sexual libertine life. One political candidate recently said that sexual freedom is more important than religious freedom. I can tell what their religion is. <laughs> <laughs> About the only restriction on sexual behavior today, Smith says, is that we must never harm or take advantage of another person. Sexual activity must always be consensual by mutual agreement. Beyond this, the dominant narrative is, if people want something, it's acceptable. This opened our culture to practices that have historically been rejected. Things that formerly shocked us now barely register a response. I suppose I don't need to give any examples. <laughs> uh, in an age of tolerance, we have simply become desensitized. Cheating seems to be normal. Group sex is accepted. Polygamy doesn't seem very far away. How did these narratives become so common, he asks? Uh, both of them contain a measure of truth, as do all of the false narratives. Uh, yes, sexual desire does lead people to behaviors that they later regret. Uh, it is behind extramarital affairs, promiscuity, pornography, but it is wrong to blame the desire itself. Uh, we don't say that the desire for food is evil because it leads some people to gluttony. Uh, or that thirst is evil because it leads some people to drunkenness. Sexual desire of itself isn't wrong. The problem is how people handle it, what they do. Uh, our culture's narrative also contains some truth. Sexual desire is indeed good. God's first command to Adam and Eve was, be fruitful and multiply, which concerns sexuality. It was designed by God. It is how we perpetuate the species and is a great enhancement to marriage. But simply because it's commanded by God doesn't mean that there are no boundaries. Simply because it's natural doesn't mean it's always right. Simply because it feels good doesn't mean it's always good. 
not all sexual desires and expressions are good and not all are bad. So Smith now moves to what Jesus said about it in Matthew 5. Jesus knew how important sexuality is, how it can destroy life or enhance life. He spoke to this issue in the Sermon on the Mount. Unfortunately, it is often misunderstood, which contributes to our problem with sexuality. So we can read what Jesus said about it in Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. You have heard it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Now this passage, he says, has led many to believe that Jesus is saying that simply looking at someone and appreciating their beauty is the same as committing adultery. It might appear that way. But Smith says that a closer look reveals something different. The word that is used for lust, he says in this passage, is epithumia. Uh, he's going to use it a lot. So, <laughs> uh, This word has a specific, had a specific meaning. It does not refer to ordinary sexual attraction, but to intentionally objectifying another person for one's own gratification. There's a lot packed into that sentence. When I discuss this issue with students, he says, I describe it this way. Epithumia is not referring to the first look, but to the second. The first look may be simple attraction, but the second look is leering. Lust doesn't value the person, but thinks only of body parts. Now, Smith uses a personal example here, saying it's okay to notice a woman, but if we had turned and followed her, focusing our eyes on her, dreaming of a sexual encounter with her, we would have sinned. We would have crossed over from simple sexual attraction to epithumia. Epithumia goes beyond mere sexual attraction. It intentionally cultivates sexual desire for the sake of feeling itself. It's the opposite of love. Love looks at the eyes. Epithumia glances below them. Love values the other as a person. Epithumia degrades the person. So we must make a clear distinction between attraction and objectification, between feeling sexual desire and lust. When we fail to make that distinction, we adopt the first false narrative and think that the attraction is evil in itself. But it's not, I might say here. Sexual attraction was created by God, even before sin entered the picture. Adam thought that Eve was pretty good looking. <laughs> Sexual attraction is good, uh, but like most things, it can also be misused. So now we go back to Jesus and what he was teaching about lust. Jesus is teaching about the difference between inner and outer righteousness. On becoming a new kind of person in the kingdom of God, Jesus is most concerned with the heart, particularly with developing a good heart. A good heart is free from objectification for the sake of self-gratification. Well, that was too many syllables, so I tried to translate that one. <laughs> uh, we don't look at other people as sources of pleasure for ourselves. Rather, we look at them as people in their own right. In the kingdom of God, he says, we are being transformed into a new kind of person based on our new identity as a person indwelled by Christ. Such persons will de develop inner character that is not dominated by sexual desire. That's not driving force in our life. In Jesus' day, adultery was defined as sexual contact between persons, at least one of whom is married, but are not married to each other. The difference between our day and Jesus' day is that adultery was applied almost exclusively to women back then. A man, even a married man, 
could have sex with other women, including slaves and prostitutes. The Old Testament did not forbid that. But a woman was allowed to have sex with her husband alone. The charge of adultery usually resulted in the execution of the accused woman. There's a story about that in John 8. But in Matthew 5, Jesus is speaking directly to men. Jesus explains to men that epithemia is a form of adultery. In adultery, sexual desire triumphs over a person's commitments. It's seeking pleasure for self without accepting responsibility for the other person. Adultery implies fulfilling my desire is more important than fulfilling my commitment. I don't care if I hurt others. Right now, all I care is about me. The same is true of lust. Valuing the other as a sacred being is tossed aside. So Jesus brilliantly gets to the heart of the matter. He invites us into the kingdom in order to become new people. People who value and respect others. The author writes, Some women have told me they think that epithemia is strictly a male problem. I don't objectify men's body parts. I don't look at men to cultivate lustful feelings. Uh, but, he says, I believe that while there are some women who do not lust the same way, some women still wrestle with epithemia. It just gets expressed differently. And from what I've read, sometimes it's a pretty physical lust as well. Uh, please note, he says, <laughs> that what I'm about to say is not true of all women, just as it, it is not true of all men. But it happens, he said. Epithemia usually involves objectifying a body, but it can also involve objectifying a persona, an imaginary personality. <coughs> While some women do not struggle with objectifying male bodies, they do struggle with objectifying a man's persona. Take, for example, romance novels or chick flicks. A lonely and misunderstood woman is rescued by a man who whisks her away on his white horse. <laughs> says, Think Cinderella, and you have the plot of 90% of romance novels. The man whispers into her ear that she is the woman of his dreams and he will love care for, and protect her forever. In these romance novels, women are fulfilling emotional needs, to feel loved and valued, to feel special and sacred. No, nothing wrong in that. But in these romances, the hero of the story provides that feeling, but he isn't real. Therein lies the problem, he says. He's a fantasy. He's an object worth a second, third, fourth look. There is no interaction, no intimacy, no relationship, and no mutual enhancement there. The reader is simply fantasizing because it feels good. And it's not realistic, I might say. It's out of the ordinary. Uh, just as pornography portrays unrealistic bodies, some romance novels portray unrealistic relationships unrealistic plots, unrealistic characters. And just like women don't want to be compared to unrealistic bodies, uh, men don't want to be compared with unrealistic relationships, personalities. Uh, Smith says, I, I once remarked to a class of graduate students that I thought romance novels were a female version of porn. Most of the women were shocked at the comparison. Maybe you are too. Uh, but a few months later, he says, uh, an older single woman said to me, when you compared romance novels to porn, I was really offended because I read a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> but I started to think about what you said about objectifying the persona, which is really lust, and I realized you were right. I have a secret stash of my favorite novels, uh, and they're all dog-eared at the juiciest parts. <laughs> so I could take a second look. The hero of the romance, Smith writes, is like the Playboy centerfold. It's just that one is mental and the other is visual. 
If, if you're a woman who does not read romance novels or watch a lot of chick flicks, you might be thinking, this doesn't relate to me. Uh, but have you ever thought about what, how the uh, so-and-so has a perfect husband or the ideal boyfriend? Do you ever fantasize about the man of your dreams that your husband could be more like so-and-so? That can be a form of epithymia. Finally, that does not mean the sermon's almost over. <laughs> uh, many women still struggle with internet pornography. And some women are so deeply troubled by how much they think about and desire sex. Uh, the point is that both men and women struggle with epithemia. The good news is that the solution to the problem is for both men and women. In the kingdom of God, he says, we learn a new set of stories. As we live in the kingdom, we learn that God is good, and we learn to see everything through God's eyes. Living in the kingdom, and thereby changing our false narratives to kingdom narratives, is the solution to overcoming lust. Too many people try repeatedly and fail to deal with lust through their willpower, through their tearful prayers, but yet they find no genuine change. We cannot change our heart by changing our behavior alone. That is why Jesus spoke about plucking out our eye when it offends us. He was not speaking literally, but he was using a rhetorical device called reductio ad absurdum, meaning to reduce the argument to its logical absurdity. He was attacking the commonly held notion that sin resides in the offending part of the body. And that's why some cultures today cut the hand off of a thief. They reason that if you cut off the sinful part, the sin will be gone. Uh, so, if your right eye causes you to sin, Jesus says, tear it out. As Dallas Willard often jokes, Jesus is not here advocating that we cut off every offending part so that we can roll into heaven as a blind and bloody stump. <laughs> Jesus is taking the logic to the absurd con conclusion. The problem is not in our hand or our eye. The lust is in our heart. Uh, to be sure, our, our body is involved in the act, but the real culprit is inward. In the imagination, in the heart. I lust or cultivate lust when I feel empty and have nowhere to put my strong desires. When I am not in close union with God in His kingdom, I have a void in my soul. I want to feel something, to be caught up in something. And when I'm disconnected from God and His kingdom, one of the most thrilling alternatives is lust. Epithemia allows me to feel a strong and pleasurable sensation. But like the Turkish delight in the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, it doesn't satisfy. It leaves us wanting more. The desire is so strong we're prepared to do anything to have it. We're addicted. How does living in the kingdom of God help? When we are properly connected to God and His kingdom, we find that the void is filled. Living in the kingdom is like an adventure. I never know how and when God is going to work in my life, but God always seems to do something at the right time and in the right way. In the kingdom, we know who we are and whose we are. The need to feel loved, to be important, and to be sacred and special is met in our oneness with Christ. When I set my heart on things above the kingdom, I discover that I'm part of something thrilling and exciting, and everywhere I turn, God is at work. Now, in Christ and His kingdom, I have the drama that I seek. I have a place to channel my energies. And here, Smith quotes Rob Bell. Now, if it's just me against the lust, the odds are always against me. Whatever it is that has its hooks in you, you will never be free until you find 
something that you want more than that. It's not about getting rid of desire. It's about giving ourselves to bigger and better and more powerful desires. Life is not about toning down and repressing your God-given life force. It's about channeling it, focusing it, turning it loose on something beautiful. And Smith then says, Because I know who I am and I am secure, God is good and he desires my good. I am free to see others in a new way. I no longer see them as objects to exploit, but as real persons that God dearly loves. When we live with God in his kingdom, we begin to live our life with joy, gratitude, thanksgiving, and grace. Rob Bell says this is essential when dealing with epithemia. Gratitude is so central to the life God made us for until we can center ourselves on what we do have, on what God has given us, on the life we do get to live, we'll constantly be looking for another life. Lust is really about spiritual hunger for God and His kingdom. That's the only thing that satisfies. Therefore, our sexual problems are unresolved until we enroll as Jesus' apprentices in His glorious kingdom. And we find our fulfillment there. When I was in college, Smith writes, Professor Richard Foster used a triangle diagram to answer the question. So here I have it. Ah, a little mm -hmm. visual aid. If you can't imagine a triangle, just look here. <laughs> imagine a triangle with one angle at top. The two sides rising from the base represent two aspects of a relationship. On one side, the level of commitment, and on the other, the level of physical intimacy. The base of the triangle represents a relationship with no physical intimacy and no commitment, so that's, they're far apart. But as the level of commitment rises, so can the level of physical intimacy. The point of the diagram is to illustrate that physical intimacy must be matched by an appropriate level of commitment. On a first or second date, for example, he says, there's very little commitment, so kissing is not appropriate. But as the commitment level rises, the level of intimacy can rise as well, because each person has been properly valued. Think about people who engage in sexual activity without any commitment. They are diminished by it. Ask them later, especially when they're about to marry somebody else, uh, about their past, and inevitably they will feel regret, remorse, even shame. Something important transpires between sexually intimate persons, and that is the genius of the triangle. We are sacred beings, and we should treat each other as such. Where the two sides of the triangle come together at the top illustrates that the highest act of physical intimacy sexual intercourse, can only be sustained by the highest level of commitment, and that's marriage. The triangle illustrates something else many Christians need to hear. Not all physical intimacy in developing relationships is evil. I know a guy in college, he says, who said he was not going to kiss his girlfriend until they were married. While the attention may be honorable, in reality, for him, it came from a negative view of sexuality. So one couple shared with me that when they went to Christian camps as teenagers, they were told that all physical intimacy was sinful. Each year, camp speakers would say that they had given up dating and would not touch their spouse-to-be until their wedding night. They were praised as role models, and as a result, the teens were sent the message that physical intimacy is taboo. The couple said, honestly, when we got engaged and then married, we had a hard time expressing physical intimacy because all we heard for years was the narrative that sex is bad and evil. Now, not everyone has the same experience. Uh, there is no formula that guarantees success. Uh, people who get physically intimate before marriage sometimes do things they regret. Uh, there's danger on both sides. Basically, sexual desire is a pretty strong force and it needs to be handled carefully. 
In our society, he writes, the vast majority of failure happens when physical intimacy exceeds commitment, comes before marriage. Now, like being in a relationship is one level of commitment. Uh, being engaged is another. In our society, marriage is a statement of lifelong commitment. And the highest level of physical intimacy should be saved for that highest level of commitment. And so basically society is swung from one false narrative to the other, from the false narrative that says that sex is, all sex is dirty, to the idea that all sex is good. Uh, nowadays, premature sex physical intimacy is usually the problem. But that doesn't mean, Smith says, that we ought to abandon physical intimacy altogether. With proper boundaries, it is a God-given gift to be treasured. Smith says he remembers performing the wedding of a committed and a loving Christian couple. During premarital counseling, the woman shared with her fiancé present. She said, my fiancé had sexual intercourse with several women in this past. This hurt me because I saved myself for him. But he did that when he was young, and he's changed since he began following Christ. And we have waited for marriage. But I have to tell you that one day while I was praying about it, I realized that I will have to deal with that fact forever. That's part of his soul. It's like scar tissue on the soul. Her words are instructive. We are not just dealing with bodies, but also with souls, with our innermost being. And that's why it's an important subject. Now, over the years, Smith writes, I have worked with many people, mostly men, who have struggled with epithemia. Their stories are painful, and their anguish is very real. They say things like, I want more than anything to change. And yet, they come back again and again saying, I still keep failing. Some, however, come back and share that they have seen real change in their life, that they are no longer dominated by sexual desires. What made the difference? Is there any common denominator between those who find freedom and those who don't? To put it simply, he says, we must really want to change. I know this sounds simplistic and even harsh to those who fail. They might say, but I do want to change. How dare you say I don't? When I have probed deeply into the person's heart, I have discovered they do not really want to change. They merely dislike the consequences of the failure, the guilt, the embarrassment, the shame. In order to find freedom from lust, a person must really be sick of it and understand its nature. Many have said they wanted to change, but in reality, they like to lust. Make me chaste, but not yet. Promises, pledges, and resolutions are no match for a heart that secretly cherishes sin and merely dislikes the consequences. However, I, I would also like to point out, this is me speaking, <laughs> uh, that some people do seem incapable of change. That's why we have Megan's Law in California. Law for registering all sex offenders. Pedophiles don't seem to be able to change. At least some of them would like to change, even to be castrated. But they can't seem to change the inappropriate desires. They hate what they do. But they also know they have moments of weakness. Change is not always easy. And it might be a lifelong struggle for some people. Now Smith says, those who have overcome epithemia have exposed it for what it is. A false and a short-lived feeling of pleasure that ultimately harms life. As one man I know said, it's five minutes of pleasure and a lifetime of regret. We can begin to change only when we say epithemia for what it is. It's a lie. It promises pleasure, 
but doesn't satisfy. It's like a thirsty man drinking salt water. It's destructive. Then, he says, we need to cultivate something else in its place. A strong sense of our worth, our love, and our appreciation for life in the kingdom. And healthy relationships that bring us the intimacy that we long for. Then, we find freedom. If you struggle with this, he says, be encouraged. Countless people have overcome it. Begin by praying for the desire to change. Ask God to give you wisdom to see epithumia for what it is. Pray for a strong desire for purity. This powerful prayer is often the first step toward real and lasting change. So let's pray. Father, thank you for creating us. We do not always know exactly why you created this exactly the way you did, uh, but here we are, and sometimes we struggle with these things. And we sometimes we struggle without being able to share that struggle with anybody else. But you know our hearts, you know our struggle, you know our needs. And we ask you to help each of us, somebody out there who may struggle, give them strength, and wisdom, and help them know that fulfillment is in you. We thank you for providing that, for providing a future for us that lasts forever, relationships that will never let us down, that go on forever with good, good, and better, and better, and best. Thank you for that, and we ask your help and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.